So it's 11.31, so I think we will get started. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar today on standards to help um, reduce plastic waste. It's great that you could join us. Uh, my name is Natalie, and I'm from the CSIRO's Corporate Affairs team, and I will be your host for today. Um, I would like to begin by first acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, I'm dialing in from a Wobbicle land in Newcastle. Today's webinar will focus on standards. Why? Uh, because Australian and international standards for managing plastic can help us reduce waste at all stages of a product life cycle. And this covers plastic design, manufacturing, recycling, and reuse. Um, in today's webinar, we'll be discussing what standards exist, uh, where there are gaps to help identify opportunities for new standards that can really help reduce plastic waste. Uh, before we dive in and before we get started, I'll just touch on a bit of housekeeping. Um, so we will have a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So please do submit any questions that you have during the webinar. Um, there's a Q&A function um, on the right of your screen where the question mark is. So you can submit your questions through that, um, that tool. Um, we also have a chat function to share any thoughts or comments, but please um, make sure if you do have any questions that you do submit it through the um, question and answer tool. Um, we will endeavour to get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have. Um, but should we not get to your question today, uh, please don't hesitate to send an email um, to CSIRO um, through our website. Um, so I would now like to introduce you to our first speaker, Kamar Schuyler from the CSIRO. Uh, Kamar is the best practice and standards lead for our Ending Plastic Waste mission, which has a goal of an 80% um, percent reduction in plastic waste entering the Australian environment by 2030. Uh, Kamar is a marine ecologist with more than a decade of experience in plastics related research. Um, she has studied the distribution of debris, uh, how it moves from land to sea, the risks to wildlife and the effectiveness of policy solutions to reduce plastic pollution in the environment. Um, thanks Kamar for being here, um, over to you. Thank you so much Natalie. And thank you all for attending this webinar. This is really exciting for me because we are um, presenting a project that we here at CSIRO have completed in collaboration with Standards Australia, looking at how we can use plastic standards to drive a circular plastics economy. So I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of both of my co-authors on this work, Connie Ho and Fariba Ramazani. Now, Connie's no longer with Standards Australia, but you will get to the chance to hear later from Fariba, and it is just my absolute pleasure to finally bring this work out um, in, and, and present it to the public. Now, before I get started on the project that we did, I, um, Natalie mentioned, of course, that this is part of the work that we do at the Ending Plastic Waste Mission. And I imagine that many of you are familiar with the work that we do, but for those of you who are not, I just wanted to give a brief overview of some of the work that we're doing in the mission. So, let's see. Um, the Ending Plastic Waste Mission, as Natalie mentioned, has an ambitious goal to achieve an 80% reduction in plastic waste entering the environment by 2030. And the mission aims to drive Australia's circular economy and create systemic change through data science, materials and manufacturing, recycling processes, and whole of life circular solutions to reduce plastic pollution. The projects that the mission is undertaking fall into five different work areas that we've listed here, the behavior change and incentives, supporting best practices and standards, information and data for decision making, waste innovation and revolutionizing packaging. Now, when we first started in the mission, as we were developing the mission, setting our aims and goals and determining the key areas to focus on, we kept hearing over and over again from partners in all sectors how important standards were. We just kept, that was a message that kept, kept, kept being emphasized, that standards are critical to increase certainty for the business sector, to reduce contamination and recycling, to drive innovation and uptake of new products, just to name a few reasons why standards are important. So we decided within the plastic waste mission that an important pillar was to advise on the development and implementation of standards and best practices to support business, industry, and the public in implementing a circular plastics economy. Now, standards are 
I have to admit, even here sitting talking to you as the uh, standard and best practices um, work package lead, they are often an overlooked aspect of life. So in, in our general life, if we think about standards at all, we typically know them as ways to ensure our safety and quality in products. But in fact, they have a huge variety of other functions that are really critical in our society. They include standardizing information and measuring, reducing variety, ensuring compatibility. Fariba is going to talk a little bit more about the critical role of standards after, uh, after I finish here. But in this package, we recognize that there was a real opportunity to leverage standards to help achieve the goals of the mission. But in order to know where precisely to focus our efforts, we first needed to understand what plastic standards already exist and where there might be opportunities to better leverage these standards to reduce plastic waste. And it was an obvious uh, connection here to do this work to partner with Standards Australia. Well, what did we do? Now, our goal was to find all of the standards about plastics that currently exist. So we conducted an extensive search for every standard that we could find related to plastic. Now, as you can imagine, this could end up being a mammoth undertaking. So we needed to narrow our search so that it would be manageable. What we did do was include general standards on plastic, but we did not include specific product standards or material specifications. So that would be things like the APCO and ACOR specifications for recycled polymers. And we also did not include regulations in this iteration of the work, again, so that we could keep it somewhat manageable. Now, we ended up finding 95 different standards um, and so we created a searchable online spreadsheet, which I'm going to show you later on our website. But looking at the uh, at the standards like this in this in this kind of list format, it's really difficult to kind of grasp what what we're really looking at here. Where are the important standards? What's missing? It's really tough to tell when we're looking at a, a list. So we wanted to have a way to visually understand what is out there. So to do this, we decided to organize these standards around the principles of the circular economy. That's where this diagram comes in. It's a little bit complicated, so I'm going to walk you through it, but it's also available on CSIRO's Ending Plastic Waste website if you'd like to refer to it or take a closer look. So what we do is we'll start here in this inner ring, and, and this is a bit of a key on the right-hand side here to um, what each of these rings stand for. But along the inner ring, we have the main stages of the circular economy. So starting here, we start with feedstock, design, manufacturing, consumer use, reuse, and recycling. So this is kind of how that circular economy um, uh, in, in theory uh, works. So starting from our feedstock and coming back again to the feedstock. We also have a couple of, uh, of categories that are split off here. So this is uh, things recovery. So things like waste to energy and biodegradable plastics, as well as disposal, including landfill. Now, in a, in, a, in a full circular economy, you might argue that waste to energy and biodegradable, these are still products that we can use. So um, by some definitions, that would be part of the circular economy. But we're really focusing here on the plastic circular economy. So how do we get that plastic circularity from start to finish? And, and so that's why we've had waste to energy and biodegradable standards kind of going off onto, onto outside of that um, plastic circular economy. So moving outwards from this, from this inner ring, we move one ring out, and these are subcategories. So each of these categories is then split into further subcategories. So for example, in your recycling category, there's, lots, there's standards that apply to the entire field of recycling, more to data and testing, collection and distribution, facility and process, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, on the, on the outer ring, we have some materials and process standards. So in some instances, we have standards that are specifically related to certain polymers or standards that might be related to contamination. So we tried to give a bit of an overview um, at, with categories and subcategories. Now the dots, the black dots represent uh, international standards and the white dots represent Australian standards. And so what we can see is that in areas where we have more dots, we have uh, significantly more standards than um, in areas where we have fewer dots. Okay, so a bit of an overview. 
Well, what does it all mean? What are the take home messages? What are the key findings that we found? We can see that there is a real opportunity here to create and adopt Australian standards. Of the 95 standards that we identified, nine of them were Australian standards. Four were originally implemented internationally and were adopted for use in Australia, and the others uh, were, were developed here in Australia. So this is a great opportunity for Australian experts to get involved in the national and international standards development space. Most of the standards that we found fall within the broad categories of recycling, where we have 31 standards, or recovery, where there were 34 standards. So recovery standards encompass mostly standards around biodegradability or compostability, with a couple of standards as well on waste to energy. Now, there were 11 overarching standards, which were uh, in the center of that diagram, which apply to the entire circular economy and don't fit into any one particular category. And what we see here, it, this diagram, uh, the circular, this uh, triangular diagram rather, is the waste hierarchy. So where we want to see our treatment of waste is really on these upper levels. So reducing and conserving materials. And if we can't do that, encouraging the cyclical use of resources and shift incentives to stop wasting. And as we move down, these are less and less desirable places for us to be. So what we can see is with the number of standards that are pertaining to recycling and, um, and uh, disposal, we really are missing out standards in those higher levels of the waste hierarchy. So for example, designing um, for reduction of, of, of raw materials. Now what I'd like to do is take us to the website. So I can show you uh, the, the resource that is available and, and we can walk through um, what, what that looks like. So when you jump onto our Ending Plastic Waste Net website, we have a, a brief description of what we've done. We have the circular economy diagram that I walked you through earlier. Uh, we have a bit of on our key findings, future directions and applications. And then we get to the real um, meat and potatoes, I suppose you could say. And, and these are the actual standards, which are entirely searchable. So you can either, if you're interested primarily in recycling standards, for example, you can search by the recycling category. If you're interested in uh, the country of origin in only the Australian standards, for example, you might be filtering by those. You can also uh, do a search function. So if you're interested, for example, in uh, PVC standards only, um, now what we need to do is uh, undo these filters. And, and then we can see all of the standards that apply to PVC in specific. So this is a, a, a place where we hope that users are going to be able to, to come to, de, to identify the standards that are particularly relevant to their area of interest. Now, I'm going to get us back to the PowerPoint presentation, I hope. And I believe that there should be a link now adding into the chat as to where you would find that website. So the important thing now is what are the next steps? In terms of this tool and in leveraging standards to reduce plastic waste, we are very keen to do a version 2.0 of this work. We're going to be led by the needs of our partners and our collaborators, but there is certainly room to expand the scope of the work, potentially to include specifications, include regulations, or to create industry roadmaps for in the implementation of circular economy principles. And we've really uh, appreciated this work because it's been a broad overview of what out, what's out there so we can see where some of those gaps are and where might be productive next steps. But we also know that there is appetite for deeper dives into the material. For example, looking at um, uh, standards around product labeling schemes or standards for very specific topics such as compostability or chemical recycling. And these are areas that we are eager to, um, to delve into further. Now, before I turn it over to Fariba, I also wanted to say that besides developing this tool further, there are also, of course, opportunities for either developing new standards or adopting existing international standards here in Australia. And I mentioned before some of the different functions, some of the different roles that standards can play in, uh, in, in terms of the, the Australian, Australian life and, and the economy. 
And there are, I guess, four broad categories that we can roughly group standards into. So those are quality and safety standards, information and measurement standards, variety reducing standards, and compatibility standards. And within each of these particular areas, there are certainly opportunities uh, to implement new standards which could help drive waste down. So if we're looking at quality standards, we can really leverage quality standards to increase durability, reusability, recyclability of our current products so that instead of letting them go down into the recycling category, we're actually encouraging um, reuse and, 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 um, uh, and, and, and well, particularly reuse of those, of those um, items. In terms of information and measurement standards, it's really critical to ensure that consumers are aware of the environmental impacts of their purchasing choices. So labeling of recycled material content, you know, how much, how much recycled material is actually in that item that you're thinking to procure either personally or for your business and how do we make sure that there's a market for recycled material. Uh, and, and that um, those those in measurement standards, information and measurement standards also include um, information on how to how to to recycle those products properly. So things like the Australasian recycling label are very critical in this particular area. We have also these variety reducing standards, and this is a really fruitful area in terms of harmonizing existing packaging to reduce variability. So for example, we have lots of multi-layer packaging, which is very difficult to recycle. And so by um, reducing the variety in, in that those types of packaging, we can really help recyclers address um, the, the fewer uh, specific um, designs that there might be. And finally, compatibility. So harmonizing standards between jurisdictions to increase efficiency. So uh, of course, one example of that is, is making sure that the guidelines for the use of recycled materials are standardized between neighboring jurisdictions. Or for example, that the guidelines for what types of materials that you recycle are harmonized uh, from state to state. So these are just a few examples of the ways that we might be able to leverage future standards to reduce plastic waste. I think that's it for me. So thank you so much for your, um, your attention. And um, I'm going to now turn it back to Nat to introduce Bariba. Thanks, Kamar, for the comprehensive overview of your work um, and the important role of standards. Um, it was helpful to see, too, the uh, mapping work displayed in a graphic form. Um, and I put the um, link to where people can find that to have a closer look on our website in the chat function. Um, and also just a reminder to our audience today, if you do have any questions for Kamar, um, please don't forget to submit um, your question and we'll address it at the end. Um, but as Kamar pointed out in her presentation, um, this, this research was conducted in collaboration with Standards Australia. And from Standards Australia, we have Dr. Fariba um, Ramazani here with us today, um, and she is a research analyst with Standards Australia. Uh, Fariba's research area includes standardisation, environmental economics, circular economy, and renewable energies. Um, and she will now present. Thanks for being here, Fariba. Thanks, Nat. And hello, everyone. Um, it was such a big pleasure for us to have um, a collaboration with CSIRO in this program, um, in this project as a part of the circular economy program that we have. Um, let me share my screen with you. Um, I hope you can see my um, presentation here. Um, so as um, can I uh, briefly explain, we think that the standards are very important for reducing plastic waste. And um, I'm going to have a closer look at why they're uh, important and what programs do we have at the Standard Australia in that area. But first, let's see what the standards are. Um, as ISO defined the standards, uh, standards are documents established by consensus and approved by recognized body that provides rules, guidelines 
are characteristic for activities and their results. And that consensus is an important element of standards. And how it is achieved is usually through the um, development process and publication process of standards when we bring um, experts uh, together in a technical committee to discuss their ideas about the standards. And also before publishing the standards, we ask for public comments. Um, and it's on the ground of that consensus, as well as balance and transparency, that the standards are considered as significant guidelines and are accepted and implemented widely around the world. Um, there are several technical committees around the world uh, which are looking at the standards in plastics. Here I brought three examples for you. The first one is ISO TC61, which, look, which is looking at um, standardization and uh, methods for test and specification applicable to plastics and its material, um, its products. Uh, it is a big technical committee. They have 14 subcommittees together. They have published 712 standards and they have 105 standards under development. One of their subcommittees is SC14 environment, environmental aspects, which uh, looks at the environmental and sus sustainability aspects of plastics. And their focus area includes waste management, plastic waste management and plastic recycling. They have uh, 36 published standards and 10 standards under development. Um, we use most of those standards in our um, study because we found them very useful in solving the waste problems. A good example is ISO 15270, Plastic Guidelines for the Recovery and Recycling of Plastic Waste. Another technical committee is TC, um, ISO TC 323, or Circular Economy. And um, it, it, this um, technical committee looks at the framework and the standards uh, and requirements for the implementation of activities related to circular economy. And um, their work is related to solving plastic waste problem um, because some of the topics that they are working on, such as measuring and assessing circularity and analysis of case studies can be used and applied in plastic uh, waste management. This is a, a new technical committee and they are currently working on six standards. Australia is a member of this technical committee, but we are not a member of um, TC61. I come back to that point um, in a few minutes. And the last technical committee I have here is IEC TC111, uh, which looks at environmental standardization for electrical and electronic products and system. And um, some of the um, standards that we have used in our project is the standards, which looks at end of life information and recyclability rate calculation or material efficiency consideration in um, environmental um, conscious design. Um, standards can impact plastic recycling and reuse in different ways. Standards can ensure consistency and reduce confusion um, among both consumers, communities, and industry. One of the very important standards in this field are the standards which help with terminology. So they provide a common way of communication and improve communication, which can facilitate uh, the recycling market and the trade of um, plastic recycles. We have life cycle assessment uh, standards, which provide tools to evaluate the resource efficiency and also measurement standards. Um, they provide in, um, information around sampling and testing um, requirements to measure the um, sustainability and environmental aspects of plastics so they can improve knowledge dissemination. And also a standard can increase consumer confidence, promote social acceptance of recycled products and improve economy of scales. I have some examples here um, on the standards um, related to these areas. And generally, there are so many opportunities for standards to promote plastic circular economy and um, solve the plastic waste problems. 
um, standards can help with design for circularity, driving demand for circular problems. One of the, um, or two of the points that I can, um, I'm interested to point to here, uh, and Kamar briefly talk about them is that standards can help with increased collection rate and scale up reuse and recycling. Because as Kamar mentioned, we found that there is a significant inconsistency on um, the definition and classification of what is waste and what is non-waste, what is hazardous and what is non-hazardous, which is a significant roadblock um, to the uptake of recycled materials, plastic recycled materials especially, not only at international level, but also at national level. And um, different jurisdicts have different opinion around that. Standards can help with harmonizing on the definition and providing clarity on those definitions. So what are the next steps from Standard Australia point of view? First of all, we are currently re-looking really at Australian participation in ISO TC61 to uh, make sure that Australia has a voice in um, standardization at international level. We also invite um, all Australian experts to participate at, at two mirror committees that we have, EV22 and EV21, and bring their ideas around the standard requirements about circular economy and environmental management. Also, we continue our discussion on how standards can foster collaboration and eliminate roadblocks to advance circular economy in Australia. We have um, set up a, um, an advisory group, circular economy advisory group at the Standard Australia, where we have brought um, leaders in circular economy together, including CSIRO, to look at um, the way that we can um, help with, this, uh, with the transition of Australia to circular economy. And uh, we're so proud that this project, Plastic um, Standardization, is one of those um, the areas that we have looked at so far. So the objective of SIEC is identify areas of priority for us, for us to lead and influence internationally in circular economy, be a sounding peer review for our um, circular economy program, um, figure out how we can circular, circularize um, our standard catalogs and also build and strengthen partnership with key influencers because we believe that together we can accelerate Australia's transition to circular economy, including plastics and solving plastic issue. That's, pro um, that's pretty much from me. Um, please reach out if you have any question or uh, if you're interested to learn more about our programs. Thank you. Thanks so much for your presentation, Fariba. Um, we now have the opportunity for questions. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, please do use the question tool um, on the right-hand side of your screen to yeah. submit any questions. Um, and we have, um, have had some questions come through. So I might just um, field some of these questions out to um, Kamara and Fariba to address. Um, so the first one, um, Fariba, I might direct this to you if that's okay, but um, why is there such a disparity uh, between standards internationally and domestically? That's a good question. Thanks, Ned. Um, first of all, let me explain that when we have international standards, for example, ISO standards, in many of the technical committees that they're working on developing those standards, Australia is a member of those committees. It means that we have a voice in developing those standards at international level. And uh, that is a great opportunity for us to implement our ideas in those um, international standards. Um, however, the main uh, area that um, the main, I can say, different that we have here is that we develop standards based on the demand that we have, based on the ideas that we receive from experts. So among those international standards, um, when we see that there are some standards, international standards that are applied very frequently in, in Australia, sometimes our technical committee members, they think that it's important to review those standards and amend them um, to suit um, Australia properly or more properly. We might sometimes amend them and uh, fix them. However, there's sometimes 
um, some international standards that they don't need any changes and we, we accept them as is. But at the end, it comes to the um, experts' ideas. If they think that there are the needs uh, for more Australian standards, we will be more than happy to work with them to develop Australian standards. And um, one of the findings of this research, as Kamar pointed to, was that we need more experts' um, engagement and we need their ideas on how um, standards can help with the plastic problems in Australia and what Australian standards are necessary to be developed. Thank you for that. Um, Kamar, I have a question for you. So um, a question that's come in is effective standards are very much dependent on a good knowledge base, including about end use and recycling potential, as well as environmental harm. How is the development of standards linked to the latest research and what is the review process? Thanks so much, um, Natalie. I actually, I might throw that to, um, well, I'll, I'll answer the, on the part that I know and if Fariba wants to, to answer more in terms of, you know, from a standards Australia process. But I do know that as we develop standards within uh, Australia and, and also within internationally, standards are developed with expert opinion, so expert input. So this, the people that develop standards, there's a whole committee that's relied on that has expertise across a broad variety of areas. And so that includes scientists, um, you know, sci CSIRO scientists have sat on a number of different panels in terms for, for developing standards, and I'm sure that will continue to be the case. And so, so these experts can bring in the uh, information about the latest research and, and, and technical knowledge from their perspective. And that standards making process, as Fariba, I think, mentioned, is a consensus based process. So all of the experts have to agree um, on, on the, the wording and on the language of that standard as it comes through. Yeah, can I just add to that, um, that standards are voluntary documents. So there isn't any um, regulatory requ requirements from our side unless um, the authorities and regulators decide to make a standard um, necessary and compulsory. Um, and that's the main difference between the standards and um, the specifications that usually the authorities provide. Um, and that is something else that can um, make, um, increase the certainty and confidence of the industry in using standards because we're not forcing the standards to be implemented. However, we are always encouraging um, the industry expert to participate and bring their ideas on what the standards are necessary to be developed. Thank you. Um, another one I think I might direct to you, Fariba. Um, would you consider looking at um, testing for standards for recycled waste plastics to ensure contaminants, et cetera, are at acceptable levels? Um, yes, yeah, so testing and sampling is always one of the very important group of standards that we are interested to look into. Um, I know that there are some specific um, sort of requirements and um, parts of plastics that they are looking at the sampling and testing requirements of them. But um, again, it depends on what technical committee decides that it's the best uh, or the most important aspects of testing that we really need to look into. So um, yeah, we're considering that in our um, new standard development, but if there is any specific area that, again, industry is interested, just let us know, yeah, and we can look into that in more detail, yeah. Thank you. Uh, a question has come through um, about the regional applicability of this work and standards. So, um, you know, we've sort of covered Australian standards, um, but, you know, uh, this question here is around um, Asia and how it has different waste system. Um, so I guess the global applicability of this work, um, for example, you know, recycling um, labelling means little if you don't have recycling infrastructure and rely on waste pickers, for example. example. So wanting to know a bit more about the regional applicability. 
So I might I might um, take a stab at that, and then uh, Fariba, you can add as well. But in terms of the recycling label and at that particular example, I, I think that's what that question was was asking about. In terms of the recycling label, um, yes, certainly that recycling label is very much directed uh, to um, to the existing recyclability within Australia. So the Australasian Australia and and also New Zealand. Um, but I think the the idea there was was to provide provide consumers with some really directed information, not just about the product itself, but also about the packaging. So there's in the Australasian recycling label, there are, uh, you know, what do you do with the, the lid? What do you do with the actual bottle itself? And yes, that, that's going to be applicable primarily for places where you do have a waste management infrastructure put in place. There are other standards, however, that are that are international standards that um, govern, for example, international trade and how um, and, and no matter where your product is being sold, that standard is going to apply. So that that is uh, that, that there are standards that have broad regional and international applicability. Um, and I think it is important to consider that um, in, in different countries, the regulatory and the standards landscape might be different from Australia, and it's it's different difficult for us to comment, I think, on, on how other countries might want to implement those standards processes, but I think that standards in, in general are applicable across a variety of, of different uh, scales, regional and international. Yeah. Did you want to add anything, Fariba? Or... The thing that comes to my mind that I can add is that because with most of those international standards, um, many of um, the East Asia countries are um, a member of those technical committees as well. So when those standards were developed in those technical committees, they had their voice and they had um, the opportunity to bring their ideas considering all the regional needs and requirements for standards. So um, those standards are in a way developed in a way um, that could be applied by those countries as well. And um, that's one of the um, advantage of the standards, international standards, that when they are um, agreed on at international level, it means that they can be used in different regions and it can um, facilitate the trade uh, of, say, for example, recycled plastics between those regions. But as Kamara said, at the end, it comes to what um, rules and uh, what specification each region and each country have regarding um, the use of standards or even um, the definition, if they have anything that is um, not very in line with the international standards. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question that's come through is around recycling. So it's fairly common that people see the recycling symbol and assume a plastic is able to be recycled through curbside. Um, however, with some plastics, this is not the case. Is there a way to utilise standards to disincentivize the use of plastics for which recycling infrastructure or capability doesn't exist in Australia? Yeah. Oh. Were you going to say something for that? I'm happy to. Yeah, I was just saying that that's a very excellent point that um, one of the things that we found in our um, CA group was exactly the same thing that plastic has lots of um, potential and lots of opportunity to be used in different uh, products and infrastructures. However, uh, we don't have the required infrastructure in Australia and we are collaborating with the um, leaders uh, to facilitate the use of plastic in different areas. For example, one of the things that we're working on is to looking at how to use recycled plastics um, in roads. And um, there are so many concerns around that that needs to be addressed by both industry and community as well at, at the first place, and then the standards can also help with them. But we're happy to have uh, to continue our conversation and provide um, any sort of um, standardization opportunities that can improve and facilitate the use of um, plastics, any type of plastics in different areas. And also we provide um, education and awareness programs um, to improve the general understanding of what can be used in different areas, what type of plastic, and at what limit it can be used. Yeah. Yeah. I might also add to that that there are other programs in addition to standards that can be applied. So what that uh, that idea of um, disincentivizing 
the use of certain plastics. So, you know, that's kind of in that in the lines of uh, reducing that variety. So, so really coming down to, you know, what are the what are the, the standards that we can recycle? And I think there are other ways. So, for example, um, APCO is working on some voluntary measures of reducing and eliminating problematic plastics. And some of those problematic plastics are the plastics that are less able to be recycled easily. And so I think there are lots of different ways to uh, to drive industry and, and, and a lot of that works actually being driven by industry themselves. Thanks, Kamar. Thanks, Fariba. Um, Fariba, I have a question for you. Um, so what does Standards Australia do to understand factors that influence adoption of standards by industries and regulatory bodies? Um, and how does Standards Australia use this understanding to increase the ability of standards to drive change? Um, so we are very close, um, in very close contact with our users, um, our standards users, and we usually um, have different sort of webinars and programs to get their opinions and ideas on our standards. We also um, have different sort of um, customer feedbacks to make sure that the standards that we have meet their, um, their needs and requirements. But uh, and at the same time, um, as I mentioned, through the technical committees, we're always in very close contact with the leaders and industry experts to assure that um, our standards are um, meeting the needs and requirements of the market. And um, if there is any change requirement, we will be more than happy to hear about those changes and make those required changes to assure that the standards can be applied by industry broadly and can meet their issues and problems. Thank you. Um, Kamara, a question for you first up. So how advanced is the world, like, um, like the accepted definition for the circular economy worldwide? And is there a standard for that? So there is a standard um, that was implemented in uh, Great Britain about um, how do we implement the principles of the circular economy into organizations. But there, and, and I think the circular economy is developing further. I, I think that I, I saw some questions that came up in the chat about, you know, we've got all of these standards on recycling, but what about all of the, the you know, we, we really recognize that we need to be uh, influencing higher levels of the waste hierarchy. And part of that is because those principles are still developing that the, all, the, all the principles of circular economy are 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 not as advanced as our as our understanding of recycling. So there are, as Fariba mentioned, there are uh, international committees on circular economy that are working on developing those internationally agreed upon definitions of circular economy. In terms of how far along those are, I, I can't answer that question because I don't sit on those committees, but if you can, Fariba, that's great. Yeah, sure, exactly. One of the key areas that um, TC323 is currently looking at is to provide terminology and definition on what is circular economy in general and any aspects related to circular economy. Because without those um, definitions, there's always some sort of confusion and uncertainty between the um, players, between the stakeholders that um, may um, negatively impact the circularity and transition to circular economy. So yeah, that's something that um, is currently happening at TC323, uh, yeah, to, to provide terminology, accurate terminology, which can be accepted worldwide. Um, I might be able to sneak in one last quick question. Um, so standards um, can be quite expensive and is there any sort of advice, I guess, for organisations such as not-for-profits or um, organisations that have um, resource constraints about how to reduce and minimise plastic waste effectively? So regarding um, the um, standards and their value, so um, we found out that the value that the standards can bring into the economy, including the the plastic circularity is really quite significant. So there are many studies that look at the economic impacts of standards and they all point to the um, to the fact that the standards are so important and they have a broad economic impact um, in Australia and around the world. And um, the value that we have for standards um, based on the studies that we had, the, the fees and price that we have for standards is very smaller compared to the value that they can gain from standards. So if it comes to um, the value of standards, uh, we believe that 
it's heaps higher than um, the um, fee that it might include. And um, I'm sure that all organizations, whether they're smaller, um, large businesses, they can gain um, those benefits when they use those standards. Thank you. Um, so that's all we have time for for today. Um, thank you everyone for dialing in and for joining us. I hope you found it useful. Um, today's session will be recorded um, and it'll be made available on our Ending Plastic Wastes um, website over the coming weeks. So please do keep an eye out. Um, and if you do have any further questions, please don't hesitate to send um, us an inquiry through the CSIRO website. Um, and thanks again. And thanks again to Kamar and Fariba um, for your great presentations today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. Thank you.